So Jesus dies, and then in chapter 27, verses 51 to 53, Matthew tells us that the curtain tore, the earth shook, rocks split, but most surprisingly, tombs were opened and saints who had died were raised to new life. But all this took place on Friday. And then the text tells us that they waited to come out of their tombs until Sunday after Jesus' resurrection. And then these saints with Jesus went into the city and they appeared to a bunch of people. So this is where critics are going to joke that this is some kind of zombie apocalypse. So there's two general approaches to interpreting this text. And personally, I think both have explanatory power. So on one end of the spectrum, you're going to have some scholars who are going to argue that this was a real historical event. On the other end of the spectrum, some scholars are going to argue that Matthew here is employing a literary device within this historical narrative to capture a theological point. So Greg Lanier, he's going to be on this end of the spectrum. He's going to argue that this was, in fact, a real historical event that took place. I'll put a link to his article from the Gospel Coalition in the description section below. And then on this end of the spectrum, you're going to have scholars like Michael Bird, Mike Lacona, and they're going to argue that Matthew is employing a literary device. I'll put a link to Michael Bird's video as well in the description section below. So let me start with the view that this is a real historical event. So three reasons here. Number one, the passion narrative is a historical account, right? So its genre is history. Reason number two, in the surrounding context, Matthew emphasizes eyewitness detail. So for example, in verse 54, Matthew tells us that the centurion saw the earthquake. And reason number three, Matthew links all the events here with the word and. So he talks about the curtain tearing and the earth shaking and the rock splitting and so on. So given this, it's unlikely that Matthew all of a sudden switched things up and utilized a literary device that intends to communicate something ahistorical when everything around it is historical. Now, within this view, there's a potential theological problem. So these saints who were raised, what kind of resurrection was it? And there's two general options here. So first, it was a Lazarus kind of resurrection. So they're raised to life, but then they all die again at some point. Or second, this is their final resurrection. But if it is, and here's where the problem comes in, if it is their final resurrected bodies, then that means they put on their final resurrected bodies before Jesus did. But Paul tells us that Jesus is the quote unquote first fruits of resurrection. So you can check out 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. So this leads us to the opposing view. So scholars like Michael Bird and Mike Lacona, they're going to suggest that Matthew was employing a literary device within the historical account to highlight a theological truth. So let me highlight a few reasons here. So first, Bird asks the logical question. What were the saints doing in the tombs from Friday to Sunday? So maybe they were just sitting there, but the oddity of this event, that the saints were resurrected before Jesus and they just waited until Sunday to come out, indicates that Matthew is employing a literary device and not trying to communicate something that historically actually happened. And second is the theological problem that I've mentioned already. Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection, not these other saints. And then third, Lacona argues that you're going to find similar kinds of descriptions about other great leaders in antiquity. And so maybe Matthew is utilizing a literary strategy familiar to his day. So here's Lacona's view, and I'm getting this quote from Michael Bird's video. He says, It seems to me that an understanding of the language in Matthew 27 verses 52 to 53 as special effects with eschatological Jewish texts and thoughts in mind is most plausible. This difficult text in Matthew was a poetic device added to communicate that the Son of God had died and that the impending judgment awaited Israel. And Michael Bird's view is very similar. He says, my understanding of this text is that it is not historical and that it blends the present and the future together so that Matthew provides a cameo of the future resurrection at the point of Jesus' death to underscore its life-giving power. So Michael Bird bases his argument off of this point right here, that Matthew blends the present and the future together, and he does it elsewhere in Matthew's gospel account as well. And specifically, he references the Olivet Discourse. So if Matthew did it there, right, if he blended the present and the future together, in that text, then maybe he's doing it in Matthew 27 as well. So Bird says that Matthew sees the sacking of Jerusalem as the quote-unquote dress rehearsal for the second coming. So he merges the destruction of Jerusalem 
with the second coming of Jesus because he sees the destruction as the first installment of the final judgment. So again, if Matthew is blending the present and future together in that text, then maybe he's doing it in chapter 27 as well. So what do you think? Who's right in this debate? Is Matthew trying to record a real historical event where saints came back to life and went out with Jesus to meet people? Or is Matthew employing a literary device to communicate a theological truth? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and we'll see you guys in the next video.